Um, my name's Gemma Milne. I'm a technology and science journalist and researcher, and I'm here to be a facilitator of this stage. I'm really looking forward to this next talk that we have. Thank you so much. This, I think this is the most popular session we've had on this stage, so well done, guys. Um, this one is called Innovation on Tap with Heineken. No wonder it's popular. From Theory to Action, Adopting AI for a Competitive Edge. And for this, we've got Ross Wilson, who's CEO of Vedatech, Jim McGregor, Head of Change Enablement and Digital Transformation for Heineken, and Nick Welsh, Chief Technology Officer of Vedatech. Please join me in giving them a warm round of applause. Thank you, Gemma. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us here for this session this afternoon. Delighted to be here. Uh, I'll start with a disclaimer. If you've come along for free Heineken samples, they're not coming out, so feel free to, to leave if that's all you're here for. Yeah, perfect. Um, so delighted to be here. And really, what we're trying to do today is just share some examples and practical tips of how AI and other innovations have been implemented recently across Heineken and some of our clients. So delighted to be joined today with, uh, with as, as Gemma said, we've got Nick, who's our CTO here at Vitatech, all very much about exciting and inspiring our clients, picking the optimal solutions and bringing the right tech to, to life uh, so that we get the right experience for people. And Jim McGregor, delighted to have Jim along here from Heineken, uh, 25 years in at Heineken, so plenty of uh, service there and experience he's gonna share with us today. And specifically in this role that he's got just now of being the head of change enablement in that global e-business, a really vital role Heineken is that global entity. I just want to position a couple of things first about Vitatech for those who, who aren't aware of who we are. Um, this is our purpose statement, and we're all about improving people's experience of life and making a positive impact in the world through technology. And we certainly believe the likes of Gen AI and things like that just now are giving us a, a, another potential uh, way to, to bring that experience to life and personalize things for people in a way that we haven't been able to before. So we're really excited about that. And we've been around for 15 years creating solutions, whether it be mobile, web applications, Gen AI and Microsoft Teams apps and stuff, are new platforms that we're playing with that I think can get us to excite the user audience that we are, we're targeting. I don't know about you guys, but I struggle to find the reading uh, time for business books as much as I would like to, but I listen to a lot of podcasts. And this was something that came up just before Christmas time. And I think it resonated with me in terms of the conversations we were having with clients in terms of the conversation around Gen AI right now makes it feel like a technology in search of a problem. And we were having lots of conversations with customers saying, you know what, we've got Einstein with Salesforce, or we've got Copilot and Microsoft Hours, how do we use it? And I think that was causing some of the barriers in terms of not thinking about the problem you need to solve and is AI part of that solution or not? So that really helped us take things to clients. This was a survey I saw come out from Stanford uh, just at the start of this month. And again, one of the challenging things when you're trying to do something about AI in one of these talks, when we started this conversation in February, the landscape was very different from what it is even now because things are moving that quickly. But I thought this was really interesting. Again, Jim and Nickel to kind of talk to these top areas that are barriers. The, the biggest barrier people were seeing about implementing AI was the ability to estimate and demonstrate the value to the business, you know? I was slightly surprised that data was coming so far down because we have having conversations with people. It's always about our data sets are really poor to be able to get AI going. But that wasn't the biggest barrier. And I think what, what Jim will talk about, and I don't want to steal his thunder, but that ability to understand what the problem is and then fix the uh, solution around it, if AI is part of that or not, really helps frame the, the value you can bring. Lack of talent and skills was a big one as well. And we know the marketplace is uh, extremely demanding for, for talent there. But again, that's where uh, people like a Vitatech or others can, can help it sometimes. And that lack of confidence around the technology. If we think about the journey we've been on just even in the last 12 months, you know, we saw the hallucinations and the, the stuff about uh, pizza recipes with glue on them and all that kind of stuff. Just think about the advances we've made in the last 12 months. Think about what it's going to be like in the next six to 12 months are these models are getting better and better. So embracing technology, be playful with it is certainly our theme. And look at how do you break down these barriers and implement uh, properly. As we've been talking to organizations, we, we kind of saw three different categories uh, that we're coming up with. So uh, these were names I came up with. You know, they might work for you, they might not. But We've got those guys who are really leaning in, starting to implement AI solutions and playing with it, understanding the results and seeing how that positively impacts on the organization. We've got the people who are kind of more of the watchers, we would call them. They're on a journey, they're gathering the data, they're really watching it closely, but they haven't quite got to implementation. And then there's a group that are the, the kind of waiters, wait and see, either caught up in all the stuff that's done to run the business and not the chance to look at the new technologies, uh, or they're just kind of simply waiting to see what happens. So 
wouldn't mind a quick show of hands here so we can make sure we're pitching in the next part right. How many people would say they're in the implementation stage or they're an implementer? Okay, so a few, great. And, and Jim, I would say, is in that space as well, having done what he's done. Who's in the watching space, would we say? So a few, okay. And what about the waiters? Have we got any waiters watching and seeing stuff? Okay, well, hopefully what we're gonna do with the practical tips and hints that we come through with here, give you a bit of a guide just to get going. Uh, and be playful with it and learn some of the lessons that uh, that Jim at Heineken has, has learned over that period of time. And I put this slide in just to show, yeah, we're talking about Heineken as a big global entity and a fantastic organization, a fantastic brand, but we're working with brands at every single size from startup and scale up. So don't think you've got to be a Heineken to get this stuff going, right? We can take the lessons from these guys, absolutely, but it doesn't need an exhaustive budget and an exhaustive amount of team to be able to get you going with things. And that's one of the important lessons that we'll learn from Jim. So what I'll do is I'll hand over to Jim now and Jim's gonna take you through a little bit of a background about your, your journey with Heineken and what we've been doing in, in an innovation and a Gen AI space over the last few, few months. Okay. So first off, I'd like to say that um, before we start, I, I'm not listening to a podcast or music. I'm actually deaf, just to explain, because people often think, why has he got his uh, ear pods in whilst he's talking? Secondly, I want to say, I wanted to give you guys samples. I was saying, let's do the sample thing. And I, Ross was resident to start with. And I said, we can do Zero Zero, which is a great brand. But he just, he said he didn't have the budget for it. So if there's any kind of scoring on the speakers, it's definitely me and Nick ahead of Ross. Okay? <laughs> just, I just wanted to say that. So 25 years with the business. And as I walk through in here today, I felt like a bit of a fraud, right? Because I'm really in amongst it all in digital uh, transformation. But 25 years ago, I was a sales rep selling beer to bars and pubs. And although I'm 25 years on, I'm still very much connected to bars and pubs because I'm in the part of the business is around B2B. So there's really a huge amount of sexy stuff that we do in Heineken uh, with the global connected brewery, really fancy AI in our manufacturing, some amazing campaigns with regards to our television and social media, all this exciting stuff that we're happening within Heineken. I'm not gonna talk about any of that. What I'm gonna talk about is being part of a very practical business. Think about that B2B that I was just explaining. So we've discovered that a traditional commercial business, and let's face it, we just make and sell beer, over 300 different products. So everyone will recognize Heineken, but we have over 300 beautiful beer and cider brands around the world. And we sell those beer brands to 190 different countries. 80 of which are what we call operating companies. Now, seven years ago, I stepped more out of the commercial operation and I stepped into digital. And that's why I feel like a bit of a fraud because I am the head of change in global e-business, but I don't have a clue about technology. I was in meetings with Nick and his team and my IT team in, uh, in, in, uh, in Heineken and Amsterdam, the head office. And I swear to God, I had no idea what these fucking guys were talking about. They were talking about a different language. So we had a bit of a, a road bump and they were using all these acronyms. And I'm like, I'm with all these tech geeks and I don't know what they're talking about. But what I do know is in our business, when we're working with our customers, and I'm not talking about consumers, they have problems that we need to solve. So I just wanted to kind of highlight that to you. So part of a e-business team in uh, Heineken in Amsterdam, I'm based there. And I was number nine of a team which is now 160 people. Now we service every single area of the globe. Our biggest product, our most obvious one, is an app that a pub owner can order their beer. And would you believe that not that long ago, we were physically taking those orders in some countries. And only four years ago in Mozambique, we weren't even speaking to the customer. We were driving past their outlet. And whatever empties were outside, that's the empties that we knew that person ordered. But that had its problems because I said to the customer, well, this seems to work quite well. He says, well, yeah, when the truck shows up, 
But if the truck has run out halfway around, that's a problem for us. But the distributor doesn't know how many uh, beers he's going to need. And I speak to the distributor and they say, sometimes it comes back half full. Some... So you start to see how having an app, ordering those 16 cases of these beautiful beer brands, all of a sudden that customer knows that they're getting it. And that distributor knows what's going out. That's one small example of the 14 different products. So these are commercial pain points that we want to fix. So I did two years in, the, in London and I've been in Amsterdam for five years and it's really accelerating as we look to solve the problems of our customers using technology. So as I've built up over these years, we've got a lot of insight, a lot of best practice, a lot of information that we, we can share with um, uh, our other countries. Over 60 countries we're now working with these different products. But where do we show, uh, share all that information? Where do we let them know? It might seem pretty straightforward, but it's actually very challenging. Uh, yes, we can. Can I thank you? Technology not working, as we often see in our, uh, in our everyday lives. So we at the, the head office have all this insight, all this knowledge, but it's such a fast paced, uh, paced world. And we don't have all the answers and we work in different countries and find out that they have great solutions. So the problem I had, the very practical problem I had was I needed to create a center of excellence where I could put the 280 experiments, A-B testing, testing in market, so that anyone in those digital teams around the world could access at any time. To put the best practice when a country has had a problem getting adoption, where do you find them? To all the training material for your sales staff on how to use the technology we're rolling out. So I needed to create a center of excellence where people could find the information that they need in order to be successful in rolling out these digital products. The problem was, I had hundreds and hundreds of documents. And I don't know about you guys, but if you work in any kind of organization, often our back office administration finding things can sometimes feel impossible. I looked at the IT department. Now, our IT department is spending millions in pounds on really big infrastructure architecture, the digital back, um, on the campaigns for the Formula One, on um, driving innovation and AI and some of our big, uh, big sort of stra strategic initiatives. And I want them to help me come up with this very simple solution of how do my customers, internal and external, find the information they need. So rather than try to be on the backlog, which will never happen, even with a budget, I decided to take a chance and partner with a small, but very, very good, external company. And I just gave them the problem statement. And I said, can you fix this with me? I don't have a huge amount of money. I don't have a lot of time. But can you fix this using generative AI, which I believe personally is a game changer. In, in, and I know, again, I'm talking to the converted. But when you talk about AI, most people I speak to don't have a clue what AI is. So what I want to talk about, what these guys, is how you practically use it in a real sense. And I've had an amazing response from people using this AI tool, these guys built, using generative AI, in such a way that takes them right to the information that they're looking for, in a conversational way, it links to the documents they need. If they want to find out in a certain type of market, Every market in Nigeria, show me the best value value cases. Show me where you've experimented with a different business model. What were the outputs? Suddenly at their fingertips, using AI, they're finding it. So it's not some of the lofty things that we talk about, like Elon Musk saying that Tesla's no longer uh, a vehicle company. People debated whether it was technology or whether it was a car manufacturing. He's now, he's now calling it, as of last month on Twitter, it's an AI company. All this hype around AI. I can actually show you an example of speaking to an external provider, giving them a problem, and even though I didn't understand exactly how they did it, I know that my end users are giving me some great feedback about how easy it is to find the information they need. So I'm going to pass over to Nick. I'm sorry about calling you a technique, but uh, he's a very smart guy, and he will explain 
perhaps, how we did that. Thanks, Jim. So as Jim mentioned, one of the things that he was bringing to the table with us here was a problem statement. How do we solve a problem? And essentially, with an organization like Heineken, that's one of scale. As Jim mentioned, you've got 14 products working across 60 different countries. That knowledge that's been built up in terms of team's awareness of what's been done before, how to realize those products and channels, how to build out digital services that can make a difference. Um, that ability to be able to give staff access to that information. No one person within the business is gonna have that encyclopedic knowledge of all those resources. So there are, within the portal that Heineken have put together, hundreds of consumer-driven experiments which help them optimize how they build a campaign, how they build a portal, how they get products out to market, and they help their teams really be able to move efficiently. But the challenge is that no one person would have that knowledge. And this is where our, our AI technology comes in as perfect for this sort of problem. I think the real goal when we're setting up a project like this, and this is critical, I think, for AI, is we've got to define our problem statement because ultimately, if we're going to get the best out of the AI, we need to make sure we've got a feedback loop where we're saying, okay, how are we measuring that? Are we actually achieving what we set out to do here? So in our case, that's all about providing context to staff within Heineken on the product terminology, the strategy, the resources, and the learnings that have been applied previously within the business. It's about signposting them to those documents and those resources at the point when they need them. It's about streamlining access to those resources and critical to a project here, it's about an agile approach. I think a lot of people, when we're approaching an AI project, as we say, there's a, a tendency to think of there's massive amounts of IT scale, infrastructure, heavy lifting, training sets. A lot of scary words get thrown around by techies, myself included. Um, and I think actually, you know, approaching this from, from left field and saying, okay, can we do something on a small scale? Can we innovate and use AI to be able to solve a problem like this, move fast, deliver value to the business quickly and help those teams. So applying AI to the problem, I think anybody going into an AI project, um, you'll have another quest number of questions in your head. So tech stack and model, which technology should we be using for this? How should that work as a user experience? How do we fit that within our existing digital estate? How do people engage with the AI. How do we refresh the training set? So how do we make sure that when somebody asks a question that AI has access to the latest information? If we post new content into there, how do we loop that back in so the AI is aware of the very latest marketing deck that's been made available or the latest uh, product that's going to market? And how do we ensure consistent results from the AI? Now, I'm sure a lot of people have, have heard the tales of AI hallucination the tendency for an AI bot to make up in information if it doesn't have it. Now, how do we apply constraints? How do we put guardrails in place, prevent that um, AI from going off and uh, providing information that's not relevant to the context of what the user is trying to do? And you know, ultimately, how do we ensure that good user experience, but we're mitigating the risk attached to that, so we're actually delivering business value? I think the, the AI Model 1 is interesting. Um, anyone looking at this, all these technologies out there, I think it's good to look at the, the problem you're trying to solve, look at your problem statement. So any number of these technologies could be applied to solve the problem, but they all have specialisms. They're all strengths and weaknesses. It's interesting. Um, so Claude, for example, fantastic. If you're working in a creative sphere, you need an AI assistant similar to GPT to help you with creative copywriting or you know, creative content. Google Gemini, um, recent controversies aside, very powerful in terms of its image processing and tagging capabilities. Doesn't always get it right. Google are working on that, but I think that sort of underlines the point. We're in a bit of an AI arms race here. There's a lot of perfection and refinement going on on these products. Um, Amazon Lex, of chatbots technology, very heavily used in support circles. Very good for something like this, but actually we centered on OpenAI and ChatGPT is our go-to model. I think my advice to anybody looking at picking a technology like this, again, look at your problem statement, work with your development partner, understand the ease of implementation. 
if you have a very complex use case, there's lots of moving parts, there's lots of stages to the product the, or the AI experience you're trying to deliver, that might dictate you need a lot more complex solution. That might be Microsoft, Microsoft Copilot, for example, very good for enterprise solutions where you need the tool embedded within the workflow and the tools you're using or you're harnessing 365. But I think for us as a agile, uh, innovative project provider, OpenAI is ideal. How we did it. So this here that you can see is the, the Heineken portal. You've got the bot in the chat window. This was an um, interesting project to work on. We love a challenge when it's brought to us. Jim brought us a portal working with their, their third party portal provider, Small World. And again, multiple suppliers involved with this project an existing experience that staff are used to working with and accessing. But we needed to find an intuitive way to integrate the chatbot within there. So we have a JavaScript widget on the front end. This, you can see a little bit of this here. This is the, the center of excellence. So you can't see it terribly clearly in this, but we'll, we've got slides available afterwards. But essentially, you can ask the bot a question about a consumer experience experiment that's been run previously. So let's say I wanted to improve the search experience for the portal. I'm launching a new product campaign. I'm building a microsite. How do I do that? I can have the learnings of all the previous ones that have gone through in terms of uptick, in terms of audience engagement, what had click-throughs, what resonated with people. So I think the important distinction is the bot is not merely just a signposting tool. It's not just search. It actually reads the documents and it contextualizes them. So the information that gets brought back to you, it doesn't just say, here's a document. It says, you can do the following things. You can find out more information here. And just the value of unlocking that across the organization where you've got a multitude of that sort of internal business intelligence and being able to make that consumable you're getting the benefits of effectively a training tool as well as a search capability that is conversational. Um, so when locking solid insights, I think the other thing I would say with this is, is the tool chain. Um, to be able to achieve this, one of the things we had from a technology standpoint, we didn't want to spend all of the budget in terms of AI solving the problem for us. So we could have just pointed the AI tool at the content that was its training and off it goes. That's expensive. That's really, you know, use a hammer to crack an egg. So we looked at, can we apply traditional development techniques within our, our tool chain? So we had a uh, JavaScript scraping engine. It was using a technology called Puppeteer. What effectively that does, it logs itself into the portal. It goes through, it scrapes all the content, builds the training set. And that's something that we can then use to refresh the training data. So every time a new product segment goes live or there's changes to an existing document, the AI understands that, it picks up the content because the scrape has run. So I think, you know, again, think of that in the context of your AI tool, if you're building an AI driven solution, AI is not gonna be every part of that. So you might be tagging imagery, you might be doing image processing, you might be trying to do pattern recognition. A large part of that could be in your tool set, could be an existing technology or it could be a custom-made implementation, but not everything will sit with the AI. And in terms of the raw compute cost of that, in terms of your budget, that's an important point. I think also for me, there's a point around responsible AI use. Um, I think it's uh, Sam Altman, the, the CEO at uh, OpenAI, had a pretty alarming uh, claim that we're gonna need nuclear fusion to power the future of AI because it consumes as much power as Denmark, um, which, um, maybe a bit of hyperbole there, but in the future, I, I think genuinely we do need to look at, is our problem ripe for AI? Does it make sense to use AI to solve this problem? Because actually there could be traditional techniques. And again, is it more cost effective? Is there another way? So we had some learnings along the way in terms of the journey. Um, I think the important thing to emphasize with any AI tech that's around at the moment, we are as technologists, we're all pushing the boundaries and trying to achieve new things with it, trying to you know, realize consumer experiences or we're trying to support teams within organizations. It's very powerful, but it's very new. And I think there are some edges to that. We took away some learnings in terms of how we were working on the project, what we could do to refine. And just some small tips I'd say to people in terms of if you're doing this, plan ahead and start small. 
go back to your problem statement, fully define that, define your objectives, look at what you're going to get out of that. How can you measure the impact you're having? In our case, that's really simple. That's people freed up to do higher value work, but you might have any number of complex objectives. Again, that will help you determine whether AI is right for your use case. Pick the right AI tool for your course. Uh, um, I think for me, looking at this, there are many existing models off the shelf that we can go and leverage. If you go to AWS, for example, there are in excess of 50 different AI models that other people have developed that AWS will let you license. They may already solve you part of your problem. Not everything you do is gonna be raw development and building something from scratch. So you can you know, stand on the shoulders of existing projects and innovations and build that into your solution. Um, we talked about obviously using AI economically in there, traditional code, there's a place for that. Um, one of the biggest learns we got was how AI interrogates data and the problem of unstructured data. And text and copy, absolutely fine. Text and copy within documents, absolutely fine. Depending on your model and your use case, diagrams, complexity, slightly more problematic. There are, I suppose, workarounds for that. So if you're trying to get a, a bot to read a diagram, it's not necessarily going to read it in the way a human would in terms of the comprehension. It will try and interpret that. You can help it with live text within the diagram to provide the bot with context. You can think about within your web content, your portal or your documentation, are there alternatives to some of the visual media? And that gets around some of the issues around problematic interpretations of imagery as well. One of the key things for us was about reducing complexity. Complexity with AI can have risk to it. So we want consistent responses every time. We don't want the AI to make up things. We don't want the AI to engage in topics that are beyond its training set. So for us, you might have thought, oh, we'll jump straight to the latest technology. We'll go to cheap GPT-4 or 4.0. Latest and greatest has to be best. And that actually with this, we wanted more control. We wanted fine-grained ability to put guardrails in place, to tell the bot, don't engage on these topics. If it's outside of your training set, we want you to issue a canned response. And again, keep down the complexity. If you introduce multiple canned responses for multiple contexts, you're asking your AI to do a lot of interpretation, limit it, keep it simple, and then you can move quickly, you can get that product to market. You can reduce that risk because you're constraining ultimately the context of how your AI is engaging. And those are some of the critical guardrails. Um, around security as well, um, the value of just making sure that you've mitigated the risk by securing your infrastructure. You're looking at not just, I suppose, the AI itself, but the risk of the data itself being poisoned. So security, pen testing, those things are important, but there are other ways around that that you can use with, with the tools. Prompt engineering is critical. You need to look at the edge cases of how you're going to test that your bot isn't going to go off topic and cause problems for you. Um, be prepared to iterate. We found out as we worked through the project that actually we had an enormous volume of Excel documents and then we needed a tool to actually process and manage that content and be able to read it and interpret the Excel. So we found another JavaScript technology we could employ that would basically enable us to rip the Excel, process the content and understand it to give the bot understanding of that so it could effectively manage questions across a whole different set of data sets. You won't always know that going into your project as you work with the data that your, your AI is consuming. You're going to see problems, you're going to find edge cases. It's how you deal with those in terms of providing context or structuring your data or finding tools that help you interpret that for the bot and put it in place. Um, finally, be, be playful. Um, there's rich opportunities in terms of what you're doing with the content that your bot is reading. If you're embedding a piece of text, you're providing context and humor. There's, the bot can have that personality. You can get those little things brought through. So Jim has a wonderful bit in the, the portal that you ask it who Jim McGregor is. The bot will tell you he's the genius behind the project give them the full context. Okay. The developers particularly enjoyed reading that. But I think you know that, that's a lesson that you can introduce those sort of human nuances and those, those playful touches into the content that your bot is, is you know, basically passing and it's going to serve those up. In terms of next innovations on the project, we're looking for support in terms of more document types. Um, one of the things we're looking at is, is increasing the number of feedback loops, so rating of the answer that the bot is providing. 
making sure that we're actually capturing some feedback from end users and we're feeding that back into the recommendations. Um, we'd also do a lot of work. So one thing I'd say, keeping making sure your bot is actually performing, you should be doing regular audits of the logs, seeing that you know the questions that people are answering uh, are asking and that you're actually serving proper answers. Again, the feedback loop is critical there because you can then close that loop and make sure that you're improving and iterating. One of the other things that we've got, the beauty of um, the bot, we know who people are. We know their job role coming into the portal. We can therefore weight search results accordingly. So if we know somebody's job role, there might be particular documents that we could surface or particular resources that are gonna be more appropriate for that audience. So again, that element of personalization is unlocked through that. And we can weight search results or we may even have the bot be proactive. Imagine the person's coming on board, they're onboarding into the company there might be an onboarding guide or a quick start guide, something that we can proactively give to that person. I'd like to talk a little bit about applying AI within your organization. I think these are all really good use cases of where AI is strong. We know about automating manual repetitive tasks, very much that's process automation. It doesn't require very powerful AI to do. Um, but we recently had a hackathon within the business where we let our development team loose with different AI tools. And we got some very interesting results, but it was incredible how many of those are focused around the specific business information that enables us to do our job. So we got AI bots that could help improve our documentation, help us write better use cases for our software, AI tools that could help our customers. You know, there were some really strong ideas and two of those were actually taken into internal tools that we'll be using to help us deliver projects in the future. Uh, workflow productivity boosters. We do a lot of work with organizations who are looking to support their staff with workflow tools. I think you know the power to automate repetitive tasks is key. You free people up. So that might be access to information. It might be managing a workload. It might be proactive content being grabbed for you ahead of a meeting. There's many different applications that we're looking at. And obviously customer experience. We've got some examples of that, which we'll talk a little bit about. I'd say if you come to it new, lessons from industry, there's loads of good experiences out there that you could have a look at what people are doing, both in terms of the big tech um, technologies, but equally on the consumer side. So Meta and Google are very much about using AI to add structure to unstructured data. So it's about image processing and tagging. Obviously there are other tools available in that stack, but very much if you look at the way Meta works in Facebook, tagging of photos, picking up content that might be malicious or might be fake news. Again, AI algorithms used extensively. Microsoft's play with Copilot very much focused around embedding AI into the workflow and tools that you're using every day. Um, there is an API for Copilot. You can leverage that. If you're heavily on the Microsoft stack and your organization is, there's some natural synergies there. You know, we always all use Netflix. And I think um, the opportunity there for AI personalization is one of the key ones I would take away from that, just in terms of what you can do with that algorithm. But then on the consumer side, there's been some really quite innovative plays. Um, Heineken actually, back in 2017, used AI to build a chatbot that would engage with people and it would bust their excuses for why they hadn't watched the UEFA Champions League. And it, you had Jose Mourinho there and an AI bot that would nag you. So there are loads of fun examples of that. North Face have a, an AI tool that recommends which jacket you should have based on your lifestyle or where you're traveling or what you're doing. Um, Alibaba uses automated AI-driven product descriptions, so they don't write their product descriptions. They have AI do the heavy lifting. Amazon, frighteningly, use AI to essentially decide what you're gonna buy and buy it in from a logistics pers perspective so it's there and they anticipate your purchase based on your purchase history. That's a really bit frightening. Um, but clearly, you know, they have confidence in the data. So they're able to uh, run the whole uh, platform around that. And again, on the consumer side, um, Ole and um, Sephora, these are quite fun examples of, you know, AI driven personalization, personalized beauty uh, product make recommendations, personalized uh, makeup. These are all kinds of tools that can use image processing and personal preferences and then build a profile around that and then have a chat driven exchange. Looking at what's the future for AI, um, I think it's interesting just over the course of us preparing for the, for the event today, looking at putting together this presentation, 
Uh, we were looking at other tools. ChatGPT has obviously gone from four to four zero or four zero. Um, you know, true human-like uh, interactions with with a uh, an AI. That's pretty compelling from a use case perspective. I expect to see more of that. I think we often refer to human and AI teaming. Um, it feels very much, as I said, like we're locked in a virtual arms race for who's going to have the best AI-driven assistant. It's quite amusing. You see films like Iron Man where um, Tony Stark will tell the bot to build him this thing and he has this back and forth conversation. We're a bit of a way off that. We're probably not as far off that as we thought we were maybe a few months ago. And that's frightening because the pace of that technology change means we have to work harder. But equally, the opportunity if we get that right of disabled access, or supporting people like accessibility, different audience groups that might struggle to engage with traditional digital me media solutions. There's a lot of opportunity there. So I think that's um, you know, something we should look to. I think the rise of the prompt engineer, um, CEO at NVIDIA recently said, kids shouldn't learn programming. It's more about prompt engineering now. Um, so I think that the idea of everyone getting to grips, having fun with prompting an AI, you can ask an AI to take on a persona. You can ask it to imagine itself in a certain context. You can see how through prompt engineering and being playful, you can orchestrate what responses that come back. And then obviously you've got the guardrails that you can then apply to narrow that down and that focus. Um, but for the future, I think increasingly, we, we talk about citizen developers. I think prompt engineering will increasingly be something that's commonplace and democratized. Uh, regulatory controls, we, we're seeing EU trying to legislate in terms of AI. There are a number of international bodies that are trying to catch up here. Um, regulatory, regulatory controls will always be chasing the innovation, but we make no mistake they are coming. Uh, I think that's going to govern a lot of what we can do, but I think those are appropriate um, safeguards. And then finally, artificial general intelligence. I won't go too much into this because it's an entire topic in its own right. But this is really the point where we start talking about AI capabilities that outstrip what a human can do. And that's really where you probably hear of the term of AI agents that are out there, highly specialized, doing a particular thing, helping you book a travel trip, helping you find out music you might like. If that starts to go away, we've got AGI actually in place and working, then a lot of those terms become fairly meaningless. The AI will be able to uh, essentially go at a pace and with capabilities that would exceed what we could do. And I think that's increasingly where we start seeing the regulation coming in. Just hand over to Ross for some final thoughts. Thank you, Nick. So we've raised some stuff through there that hopefully uh, has been of interest. And in, uh, we've not got time for, for questions in the session today for, for a lot of time, but we are on stand D24 just be behind us there. So if you get any questions, Jim, Nick, myself and others in the team will be there to answer anything as you come along. Uh, we, we, we use this graph as a kind of quick sign off in terms of the fact it's a common use graph, right? In terms of the uh, uh, adoption to get to 100 million users. We see the Gen AI space in particular as, uh, as kind of impactful as the mobile phone and the internet. We've heard about blockchain, VR, AR has been the next big thing. But certainly Gen AI we see has been that and the, the adoption for chat GBT back then in terms of getting to 100 million users shows that. Come and see us in the stand. Uh, as I say, you've got the chance if you haven't registered to win some AI glasses, uh, which I'm sure would be setting you up great for the summer. Um, and these, uh, this is a QR code for anybody who wants to download the slides. Click there, take you to the landing page. It's got all that stuff there for you. Okay. Thank you very much. Please join me in giving these gentlemen a, a huge round of applause. Um, well, we can leave the slide up for a, a wee minute to give people a chance to, um, to, to take a picture or whatnot. Um, but yes, we have, we have run out of time, alas. Um, but thank you so much for sharing some really practical um, examples and advice that I think is, is normally what, what we're looking for from these kind of events. So we really appreciate it. Thank you, thank you everyone. We're gonna have